Welcome back, dear viewers, for another roundtable session in this Recognition and Rewards uh, Festival. We have a group of people here with whom I'm going to have a discussion about international reputation and the international career prospects of young researchers. Would you like to just briefly introduce yourself in uh, the round, uh, Raymond? I'm Raymond Poot. I'm from the Erasmus MC. I'm a biomedical scientist working okay. on autism. Thank you. Rianne Letschert, uh, co-chair of the national program and president of Maastricht University. Thank you, Marcel. <laughs> Hello, Marcel Levy. I'm president of uh, the Dutch Research Council, NWO. And Megan. Megan Pollock, a PhD candidate at LUMC and chair of PNM. Thank you very much. And I'm Ineke Sluiter, president of the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences, and I'm hosting this roundtable. Megan, could I start with you, with your first thoughts on this topic? It's one of the dilemmas in the Erkennen and Waarderen, the Recognitions and Rewards program. Right. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I want to use this uh, opportunity to start off with a statement. Uh, our opinion as early career researchers is that the Recognition and Rewards movement, uh, well, doesn't negatively influence the international career pros prospects of the early career researchers, but might actually benefit it. Uh, also their lives, um, recognition and rewards doesn't mean to move on from research or discharge it, but like actually look forward and um, more include normally extracurricular activities such as education and uh, making an impact or leadership. As of course we all know that, but uh, normally we're now used to be a jack of all trades and we have to do everything. Uh, and now in a team we can use the recognition and rewards to really diversify and strengthen your own talents. That's something that makes you a better person as well. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, well, with the high burnout marks, uh, numbers, and of course also the high work pressure, really uh, makes for a more attractive, well, international uh, reputation, I think. On the particular points uh, that you have selected for your strengths. Yes. That's what you yeah. mean. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Raymond? Yeah, as a flying route, I would like to use the Knowledge Coalition. Um, as you know, this is a very important organization in the Netherlands that advises the government and all the important organizations in there. Marcel is in there and also Peter Duisenberg, yourself, you're <coughs> in the KNW. They made a statement last year that they, they asked for money to the, to the Dutch to uh, basically fortify the Netherlands using you know, more, sign, more money for fundamental science and science in general. And that statement was full with excellence and you know rankings and uh, international competitivity from the Netherlands towards outwards. <coughs> and um, so that's of course one thing. Recognition awards was not in there, but it doesn't matter that much. But so the point there that they made is that they really wanted to you know basically make the the Dutch future proof. And um, we basically had a very good research strategy for that. I mean, the talk has been, we will get to that later, but on research, NWO used to hand out grants to the best ideas in, selected by international criteria. These people that are often young scientists were then selected, and you could, they could go to any university they wanted, but they do their thing, and the universities were happy to see them coming. 
And um, that system now is changing. I see different directions. There's more, you know, the career development has now moved from NWO more to the universities. That's one aspect. But also at NWO and universities under guidance of recognition and rewards, many of these international criteria have been removed and been replaced by political criteria. And that, of course, makes the selection of the best scientists, whatever that may mean, we we'll probably get to that later, more difficult. And I feel that that's going to harm us internationally, because internationally we just need to be at our best and to have the best people and to have them having sufficient money. So there's a, you know, a bit of a problem of how you're going to divide the new money, because the new money has come. And that's an important thing that maybe we can discuss here at this table. Absolutely. Could I just ask, as a matter of clarification, political criteria, what do you mean by those? Uh, criteria that not necessarily contribute to better science in this sort of narrow sense of the word, in terms of impact and also scientific quality. That's what I mean by political. I'm sure people will we want to... We will probably get to that later. Absolutely. I mean, this is the one statement. Uh, you know, we, we can diversify yeah. exactly what that means, but yeah. Yeah, we'll explore all these issues later, but let's start with the opening statements again. Marcel? Yeah, well, I think we started today with our minister, um, Robert Dijkgraaf, who actually said uh, research has, has become a global issue. Uh, and I think everybody will agree with that. And we are actually quite proud of it because I think it's good for research that it is an international affair. So we cannot talk in the Netherlands in isolation about something like recognition and rewards. We need to look to the outside world, to other countries, what it means. If not, we're going to hurt ourselves because then we cannot attract um, very nice researchers from other countries and it will be more difficult for our young people to go to other countries as well. Um, interestingly, although there is a difference in, in speed between countries, I can't think of any country where recognition and rewards is not being put on the agenda lately. Um, and again, the Netherlands may be a little bit ahead, although there are other countries that are even farther ahead. Uh, and there are some countries that are going a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. But I think it is on the agenda. But we have to take into account that the speed is not everywhere the same. And that may mean we may have to adapt ourselves a little bit if we are not going to hurt our position. Um, but still, and I really like to emphasize that, we really want to have the best science and the best scientist. Full stop. The difficulty, though, is <coughs> what is... How do you determine what is the best scientist and what is the best science? And that's what this debate is all about. But it is, as far as I'm concerned, still about excellence, still about being wanting to be the best. But then we can have a discussion is, what do you mean by the best? All right, thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, I, I won't repeat what has been said because that's always very boring. But what I see at different tables, both within the European Commission, within umbrella organizations such as the LERU, uh, that uh, discussions are being uh, are taking place on uh, the broad umbrella of recognition and reward. It's not only about what is good science there, it's about what you are saying, diversifying career paths and looking at strengths and talents of your uh, staff members. And I think we all agree there. The main discussion is around the way that we assess uh, excellent research. And that discussion also takes place in all these different yes. fora, uh, with also a LERU uh, presenting a paper on ways to improve the way that we are now currently assessing our research. So, I am not so concerned that this is a Dutch debate, uh, because that's what young generations sometimes say, it will harm my competitiveness if I want to move to the US or the UK. No, this is, as Marshall says, a broad discussion, and, and luckily like that, because it should remain an international affair. And for today, I think we need to discuss, or at least also distinguish, the broader ambitions of recognition and reward for our universities, for research organizations, and the changes that we want to uh, pursue and how we do that in a way that we don't jeopardize the position of Dutch uh, academia, because that's in no one's interest. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, we are talking about the criteria on which to assess research. We all feel the importance. But the topic of this roundtable is, in particular, international reputation, international careers. So. How does this movement, and you were focusing on the NWO policy, influence, Raymond, the international competitive status of Dutch research? Because that's just, just a little bit different from the way you were focusing it just now, maybe. Well, it depends on, you know, if you talk about rankings. And I, I, when we talk about reputation, I also mean, like, how would science help the Netherlands? 
I mean, this is one way to pitch it. I've done it myself in newspaper articles that, you know, you can, you know, I love science. This is just one way to pitch it, but it's also very beneficial for society. And we need to have this discussion like how can that science benefit society best? And, you know, like the ERC basically supports fundamental science and it does it in very classical manners. And it just turns out that the ERC actually does do the best benefit for society. That was something that I pitched for many years to promote fundamental science. But those criteria start to diverge more and more for, from the criteria that we're using here. And that is where our main worry is that these classical quantitative criteria for which we have basically assessed sciences for decades, that they're changed for political criteria that often I'm not really sure whether they really make science better or they just serve a political purpose. And that's, I think these things should not get intermixed. So this is maybe also a, a question for Marcel. Are we at this point still successful in an, attracting international talent through the NWO talent schemes? This is one way in which the international reputation could be. I think so, and I hope so. Although everybody knows we are really suffering of um, the fact that at least in the past few years, there was not enough money. So there were really excellent, truly excellent and very well judged applications that we still could not honor. Um, so that made it uh, even more difficult. I think the Netherlands is still a very attractive country, but I think the discussion on the table here, and I think that's, that's a very fair discussion, is how can we remain attractive to the rest of the world in, in, the, in the years to come? Because the competition is increasing. There's also now a lot of Asian universities that are really pulling on our very best people or on, our, on their own very best people to keep them there. Uh, and that's new competition. So we need to be more competitive every time. So I think it's good to look at this. Um, but I'm not that worried that what, what we are trying to achieve here is going to negatively affect our competitiveness. And what yeah. is your sense, Megan? Do you have colleagues from abroad who have come to the Netherlands because we are also thinking in different ways about the ways to do science, uh, team science, open science? No, not yet. Also, uh, um, myself, I don't uh, have any international colleagues. Uh, but I know uh, departments uh, who do, and um, I think, well, it's also a little bit of the other discussion. I don't want to touch that, uh, but of course, some uh, instances are actively attracting uh, international students um, or PhD candidates or postdocs, um, uh, of course, because of their excellence and more research and perhaps money. Um, but um, I, I have not yet uh, noticed that, no. And how about like the Rubicon program where people come in and go out? Yeah. Um, what is the sense about competitiveness there? <laughs> it's, it's still extremely competitive because there is simply not enough money. So you have to be very, very good in any sense to, to, to get granted. Um, but I, I, I think the discussion is, is, are we going, will this whole scheme lead that we are going to to disadvantage people who are now successful applicants in this scheme? Or will it just mean we are actually going to widen our scope and next to the people who are very successful, we will also be um, uh, uh, more beneficial to people who bring in other types of, of qualities? And I think it's the latter. And it's quite fortunate that this all happens in a time that well, we will have a little bit more money available for science in the next few years, because mm -hmm. then you can introduce these new ways and experiment with them and see what's happening and what type of people do we attract and how successful are they in the long run without hurting the people who are um, uh, successful right now. Yeah. Maastricht University is a very internationally oriented university, and yet you are promoting these uh, uh, recognition and reward ideals. So you must have thought about the impact yeah, on the absolutely. international. Could you maybe speak to that a little more? Yeah, no, I was I, I was thinking the same while you were uh, uh, giving your your answer. If you if you look at the the composition of the university, it's fifty percent non-Dutch, and we have not so many difficulties in attracting international talent. And the young generation that we are now attracting, they actually say that the fact that we are uh, having a consistent HR policy now that looks at strength and talents based on the collective objectives of the team, institute, faculty, you name it, actually means that for some people there will be more time to do fundamental research and for other people to excel and develop in their uh, education domain, for instance, with the acknowledgement that that deserves instead of everyone going for that research track, everyone writing a veiny, whereas you actually know 
maybe you should not go for the veiny because you're so good in these other domains. Focus on that. So there will be more room for some people to focus on the fundamental research and for others to focus on other strengths. So that uh, they actually come for that uh, change in our uh, policies yeah. because it will give room to more diversification of the specific talents that you need. So I've never heard we will not come anymore because there's no focus anymore on fundamental science. Not at all. It's about getting maybe more room, but also for others to make these choices and not choices randomly because that's what you want. Of course, it's part of a discussion with management based on the collective objectives that you reach. It's not like I want this and then everything goes. Let me also be clear there. So I don't really see the concern. And maybe to, to, to you, Raymond, with the, regard to the political criteria, I think we need to define what that means. Because if we talk about the whole movement towards open science, I find that a very important public value that we aim to open up our uh, scientific knowledge, our data to a broader audience. For me, if that is a political agenda, then, yeah. it, then, then I am political because I truly believe in that public value. But sometimes you position it in a way that that's then that's, that that's wrong. And I think I need to learn more where you come from. Right, that's a good question, because the question is indeed, how would something like open science as part of the criteria uh, to accept proposals, how would that harm us internationally in your view? Um, it will harm us by basically impeding doing science, because the thing is, first, we're not against the other activities. This is really like what Rihanna says about mm -hmm. the research conditions. And a lot of the things that look like a good idea on purpose, like, you know, involving the public, you have to be careful that you don't basically inhibit the science itself. I mean, I'm, a, I'm as I said, I'm a biomedics and I do quite specialized things. And if I'm really forced to involve nurses and health people, this is truly happening with some of the schemes in the Netherlands, that I'm forced to involve these people. It's just, I just cannot do my job. Mm -hmm. And if the nurses are unhappy because, of course, they don't know what to do in a specialized lab. I'm unhappy because I don't know how to employ them. And it just, it's just yeah. a very practical thing on the spot. And, of course, you know, I'm here today as a public function. I regularly publish in, you know, in popular journals on my topic. It's not about not being interested. It's just a practical issue. Like, you have to be able, as a scientist, to mm -hmm. get on with your job. And, and how about the use of teams? Because what I understood sure. from the criteria with NWO is not necessarily that you single-handedly do the outreach things and everything, but that you've thought about it and that you can collaborate with people who actually put it in place, mm -hmm. right? Your concern is the distraction. Yes. The distraction. But, but, but you said yourself, Ilika, this morning, and I, I couldn't agree more, <laughs> this is not one size fits yeah. all. Yeah. So if for your research, it is absolutely irrelevant yeah. to be multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, to work with nurses, don't do it, please. But you do other things. You, you, you mentioned yourself outreach, uh, 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 telling about your research to a wider audience. That's something that really ticks the box. And, uh, the, and, and there are many other criteria. So I think we should develop a set of criteria, let's say 12 or 14 different criteria, and researchers who are applying can actually say, well, these seven criteria really apply to me, and the other seven I'm just going to ignore. But that's very different from the situations we came from, where there was just one criterion, and that was how many papers have you published? Right. Megan, how do you hear all of this? Yes, now I actually really wanted to react to that, because uh, I think we also need to be aware of creating criteria is that we need to check all the boxes and that we don't, that's something that the recognition and rewards also really aims is that diversification in a team and that you yourself are not the jack of all trades and that it doesn't become like there are 14 criteria and uh, now we only give them to everybody who get at least 12 criteria. Yeah. So I, I definitely uh, understand where you're coming from, but I think that's also something we really need to be cautious of. Yeah, and probably also the point you made this morning, Marcel, that for NWO, your quality as a researcher is going to be central and not necessarily all oh, those absolutely. other things. We, 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 it's we, difficult. We, we, that's a misunderstanding because the wider uh, uh, recognition and reward uh, uh, movement is also about diversification in terms of, okay, you have to do some teaching and you have to show some leadership and you have to maybe have to do patient care if you're in a, in, a, in a university medical center. But for NWO, we will only look at research. 
uh, fantastic if you're a good teacher, if you're a fantastic surgeon, I, I don't care, but it's not what is important for us. So we will have an other set of criteria when we look at research and when we judge research applications. Then, for example, a university will have when they think about promotion to a professor position. Yep. And we, but mm -hmm. I think you, so we haven't made that sufficiently clear, I think. I think people are confused. And think, oh, I'm applying for a research grant. Why is education important? Well, I can tell people it's not. But I think your concern, and I, I would like to also hits, hear that from... That hits on, on exactly what Megan says. It's the being the jack of all trades. Because yeah. what I just said is not an imaginary example. I was forced with the National Wetenschaps Agenda. It's not breaking, but it's a similar program. I was forced to do that, to be the jack of all trades. And of course, I couldn't. Yeah. And then, but, yeah. but, but, but I, I absolutely think that's a fair point. But that also brings me to the point, this is rather new to all of us, and we are experimenting a little bit, and probably we make many mistakes. Mm. So yeah. we need to be a learning, a learning movement where actually say, well, this is not yeah. the best thing to do. Let's leave that behind yeah. and try something else. So I think that's important. And we do. So I can also speak on, on behalf of my own organization, NWO. We have done things in one of our application uh, um, rounds where we actually try to to arrange things in in curricula vitae of people and send them back to people of which we now think hmm, that was probably not a very no. good idea and then we change our practice yeah yeah that's right um so talking about the international reputation of the netherlands there's i've heard different aspects already you fear future um, reputation damage because sure. you think because now it's still good science exactly science will <laughs> suffer somehow from this uh, scheme but there's also the reputation for taking leadership in this discussion who of you can speak to that have, what have you heard from the international colleagues have you talked to Liam members we know that it's being done that the discussion yeah. is being conducted elsewhere also what are the sounds there about the reputation of Dutch science are our international colleagues worried no so sorry, and I'm, I may be, be biased, because I'm maybe in audiences where there are a lot it of... Hasn't, but it hasn't happened yet. It, no, exactly. It's still exactly. in the planning, so um, it's, diff it's a bit early to say how the, the international community has responded, because this is still very much in the planning, I would say. But it's also because I don't see the, the concern, because as you say, and I think Marshall confirms, there will still be schemes on the European level, on the NWO level, where you can submit applications for purely fundamental research. Yeah. That will remain the case also with recognition and reward. And there will be schemes where co-creation is required, where uh, the nurses need to be at the table. That, that will still remain also after five to ten years. So it is not either or, it's end. And so that, that and when I give public speeches on these uh, fora, that's also what I say. It's not about putting fundamental science somewhere in a corner. So that's why this concern is never discussed, because it's not, I think that's a big myth that yeah. recognition and rewards aims to put a hold or to put an end to fundamental research. Never. Yeah. Well, the uh, example I, I that wanna, you were giving, uh, uh, Raymond, is actually that, yes. part of the uh, strategic, thematic kind of research funding. And national research agenda typically has those aims. But you want to reply to... Uh, the thing is, at first, one of the misconception was that we are against recognition and reward. We think it's fine to have yeah. alternative careers. I made it already clear just now and also in the second letter. The problem comes with the criteria for that fundamental yeah. science. Yeah. And there, many have been removed. And for example, the open competition has no curriculum vitae. Sorry, I, I don't know what that means. I mean, it becomes a storytelling competition. And it's, I think it's much more important if you have the story of a very good scientist versus somebody who may not be a very good scientist. So there, I think it's, it's a bit of a technical issue that under the banner of recognition and rewards, many of these old fashioned, if you call them, international criteria have been removed and before something new was being put in place. Yeah. And that that's, that's, that's muddles the field a bit. And now well, that's, that's a fair say, point, I think. Yeah. That's an absolutely fair point. I think we have been focusing, just also in retrospection, we all have been focusing much too much on what we do not want anymore and not enough on what we want. Yeah. And that has led to a lot of confusion also with young people who said, okay, okay so I, I, I'm not supposed to say only about my publications and citations, but what do you want? And we haven't made that sufficiently clear. And I think we need to work yeah. on that and, and work is in progress on that 
with examples, with best practices, where we actually show to people, well, this is, these are ingredients that you can use. But that's, I think, uh, so if the, if the criticism is, well, you, you have removed things without actually adding new things, I think that's a fair point. And Megan, what, what kind of things do you think should be ingredients of such a narrative CV? You're yourself shaping your own career at the moment. Uh, I really actually wanted to to react to first something because Please go ahead. you you really state you want like wh what is the best scientist what how do you define that because I think that's one of the key ingredients also that we speak the same language what do you define as being the what's the so best so there's the researcher there's scientists of course then but you you wrote a counter letter to the first letter and there it's like yeah I agree with all of that of course if you want to do something different than research you should please, like you say, go ahead. It's, the issue is on if you want to do research, and that's also for international reputation an important thing. And Marcel just said, well, we removed some criteria, and now we have to fill in. It's also about how we remove the criteria, and that, that's the nuclear point on you know, what we discuss on that, that we disagree with NWO on which criteria have been removed. And that's right. the discussion yeah. that right. we need to so have. So let's go back to me. Yeah. yeah, but you indeed, you, you, st you say you do a lot of outreach yourself. Yes. But that does, and th you don't uh, get distracted by science? You it's, do. It's, yeah, okay. So, but that's, I would like it to be more scientist initiated. If I want to do outreach, that's fine, but it should not be an obligation for me. Because mm -hmm. then it becomes a difficult, and there's a funny things that, many things I'm not against, I just don't want to be forced to do so. Yeah, I don't want to be forced not to publish in Nature in 2024, because oh. I cannot do that anymore. The moratorium, sorry. I don't think it's a good idea to do that, to prevent people from publishing in non-open access journals. It's a very political Ooh. thing to do. Well, I've said this morning, and I'm going to repeat it because it's very important. Mm -hmm. We love publications in Science, mm -hmm. Nature, Cell, and wherever you want to publish. I really look at And I do realize that those are not open access journals. So we really want you also to take into account that, that, that open access pub publishing is important. But if you incidentally publish in Nature Science Cell, I'm absolutely, totally happy with that. Congratulations. <laughs> um, but it is about the majority of your publications okay. that should okay. actually better be sent to somewhere else. Yeah. I'm going to give Rianne the opportunity to, you know, give us her view of what has been going on here because we will have a little change in a little while. Yeah. With another gonna... speaker <laughs> from the Young Academy. Suddenly <laughs> disappear. Uh, yeah. Well... What I would like to see after this day is that Raymond and his group will be part of a movement in which we carefully and critically look for maybe adjusted criteria with the same aim to maintain and safeguard uh, the best science. Because there is a lot of research that shows certain biases in the criteria that sure. we have been using. Sure. Now, that's not my field uh, in academia, but there are many scholars that have shown us that proof. And it would be really fantastic if, with your expertise and your drive for this topic, that you could join to, to see, and that's exactly what Marshall says, we, we need to, um, um, if we say this is not possible anymore, what is then possible? What kind of criteria will we use? And if you could be a partner in that, sure. that would be wonderful. I think then I would go home into the weekend <laughs> With a, a not that we all need to uh, <laughs> uh, love the same. Uh, as, uh, I'm not trying to Can force you into something, but that would be really great. Can I respond to that? So I'm happily taking up that invitation. Uh, I'm really also in favor of recognition and rewards and making the Netherlands better. Um, I think a lot of things in what you say, a lot of criteria metrics are imperfect. I mean, but now the rule has been, if it's imperfect, we just scrap it. Yeah. The worry is, in the end, you end up with a storytelling competition, and that you may have scrapped all the imperfectives, yeah. but you just need to work more, and it's a technical issue, yeah. to work on good criteria and also a whole set of criteria. Exactly. Yeah. And I would even propose yeah. to Marcel to basically don't try to micromanage all the criteria. Just allow scientists to put forward whatever they want. Yeah, and that also yeah. means that the reviewers can say, well, sorry, I just don't think it's an important criteria, and that's your loss. But if you leave it all open, you whole sidestep the whole discussion on which criteria yeah. you can put forward. Yeah. Well, that's, well, okay, so that's actually my personal suggestions. I say, well, let people put in their CV, whatever they wish, and if they say they're very good in putting flowers in a face, well, exactly. that's nice, but it's a waste of word because it's not going to help you very much in getting exactly. uh, a grant from NWO. Uh, and that is the direction we are moving. That means we have to instruct our panels a little bit better. 
don't look at the flowers in the face, but actually look at things that we really find important. And we are working on that with e-learnings and videos for our panels to make a little clearer what we want. At this point in time, there are only two things that we strongly discourage slash really do not want to see in CVs, and that's uh, journal impact factors and the age index. And that's not because we dislike them, but, but because there is solid research that they actually disadvantage women, younger people, and so forth and so on. So that's the reason we really do not want to see them in CVs. If people put them still in, that's stupid, because we say we didn't want them, and it works actually in their disadvantage. I, I um, agree on the age index, I do not agree on the journal impact factor, but still <laughs> that's for also for, if you sidestep yeah. that, then the reviewers themselves can decide on whether they find it important or not. Yeah. Well, well, I, I think, think the, uh, we're they not can very look it up quite course. easily. Let me just uh, no, use my <laughs> chair's privilege, uh, uh, Raymond, <laughs> to affect the transition in a little while. And the way to do that may also be to ask whether there are any questions in the chat that we could usefully present at this point. And that, Rihanna, might be a thank very good you. moment to, to thank you for your contribution yeah. and to welcome Hanneke in just a minute. Kim, what I'm can you afraid, tell us? I'm afraid there's a technical issue because I don't see any questions in... Ah, there is a question in the <laughs> chat, so I'm very happy to see one. Um, an interesting argument I often hear in response to the criticism of the narrative CV is that writing a research proposal also requires writing skills and storytelling. Uh, and how do the speakers, and uh, Raymond Poot in particular, look at this? I'm very much in favor of the narrative. I just want it to be backed up by numbers. So do we. And numbers? That's, uh, or, so yeah. in the NIH, in the ERC, everywhere you have to write your story. I think th the problem is not the storytelling. The problem is that you need to have something solid to back it up. Mm -hmm. Evidence, and that's, yeah. And that's where we have a disagreement with NWO because they have made that number package, let's say, smaller, just put it like that, and that's where the discussion is. It's not so much on having the narrative, it's having you know, the hard numbers. It should be substantiated by evidence, yes. and it should be part of an argument for sure. why this exactly. is good science. Exactly. But I actually know that NWO is moving in this We're direction. We're moving in that direction. So we have thought about this, and we had very good discussions with people in the field who said more or less the same. Um, so we want actually, um, we uh, uh, now it, it's just words and it's not my own idea, but I really like it. We want to move away from the narrative CV and we want to go to an evidence-based CV where people make statements about themselves. I'm fantastic. That's perfect, perfectly fine if they say that, but then they have to back it up with um, evidence. And it's not always quantitative evidence, no. because sometimes evidence could also be qualitative. Uh, I've won a prize, I have been invited to give a plenary lecture somewhere, but you have to back it up with evidence. And then you can actually have a point-by-point evidence-based CV, and it's still narrative, but it's actually much more easy. It's, it's easier to judge it, probably. Yeah, thank you. In the meantime, we've been joined by Hanneke. Hanneke, would you care to introduce yourself briefly? Yes. Uh, well, my name is Hanneke Hulst. I'm working in, at the University of Leiden as a full professor in neuropsychology uh, in health and disease. But I'm here uh, in the name of the Young Academy uh, today. And yeah. would you also care to begin with a statement on your views on the international reputation and the career, international career prospects? Yes, I definitely uh, would. And obviously, I followed your conversation uh, before. And what I, I'm uh, sort of um, what, 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 st what sticks with me is that there is this idea that it's something we're going to change the criteria and that's going to end up in something that is not as good as what we have. But I would like to turn it around because it can actually get better because I think one of the things that we forget is that we as, as scientists or researchers, we also behave according to the criteria. So there are quite some perverse incentives in the system, for example, the number of pub publications. And sometimes I see people working on three articles uh, using the same data set while actually combining it in one comprehensive paper. It's actually worth more and the quality will go up. And therefore, I also think that there are actually good things about changing and that we uh, also should think about how we work. So we as scientists work from our expertise by training. And I think our methodology is not going to change because we change the criteria. So. 
our working methods and, and the research question we pose, they are still high quality. So I cannot imagine that changing the criteria will suddenly have your research being not of high quality. Yeah. And, and I think one thing that I, because I also, because I'm very enthusiastic about recognition and reward, but I, I also think that there is one particular group of people um, that is actually at a difficult uh, uh, transition, and that are actually the people that are now having to decide where they want to go. So the people that in this transition need to decide, do I go to uh, another country for the, for, for the further part of my career? Uh, but there I also see, and that fits again with R&R, &R, that uh, this is leadership, uh, uh, academic leadership that comes in. So we as more senior researchers should actually coach and help these young people that are now in this difficult position to guide them uh, to, to go to the best way. Yes, thank you for that contribution. It's actually also in the second part of what you just said that you're thinking about how about having a career in multiple countries, basically. That's what yeah. you were yeah. thinking about, right? Uh, because I'm actually also entertained by the fact that this research quality, science quality, that's the fatal attractor in all our discussions. So we're supposed to be talking about international effects, but we keep going to those criteria. I really understand that. But so how do you see, the, the how would this affect if we work according to the uh, recognition and rewards theory, <laughs> uh, how would this work if you were to advise younger researchers about entertaining the possibility of an international career? What would you tell them? Well, I would tell them to really think of a plan. So where, where is it actually what you want to move towards? And based on your plan, you make a strategy. And I think it's not that hard because that's also when you stay in the Netherlands or when you're in a totally different position. If you if you know where you want to go, then you can adjust your strategy. So someone who decides I want to stay in the Netherlands because I have my family here, that can be a different strategy than someone who knows I want to go to Harvard and that they have certain criteria, then you have to make sure that you fulfill this criteria if that's what you want to work towards. Yeah, I've, I'm very uh, intrigued by this because this is actually how we were talking this morning about research quality. It is related to the strategic goals of the unit or the entity that you're working in. And now you're translating that to the level of the personal career. I think that is actually a very interesting move. How would you respond to that, Raymond? First, to respond to Hanneke, that I think changing the criteria will not affect how I do science. I think it will stay the same. I completely agree with you. The worry comes like, who are you going to select? I mean, it's always a difficult thing. You're going to select one person over another. And then, of course, it does matter how you count, how you calculate. And that's, I think, some of the disagreements that, you know, like number of citations and journal impact factors, they have been scrapped by NWO. You cannot give your total citation limit, not the impact factors. And that's, I think I would completely agree with having additional criteria, but the worry comes in what you take away and what does that mean of how you, who you're going to select to have a position at the university or to, to get a grant. And that doesn't affect what science I do. I just try to move my best and I try to, to publish as well. But it does, I mean, in terms of international career, who are you going to select to, to give sufficient amount of money, for example, to be internationally competitive? Yeah, the journal impact factor is also the object of the DORA declaration. So this is now, there's a lot of international colleagues who agree with not using that primarily. Well, so I, I want to say one thing on that. So three quarters of Europe, of the institutions do not do DORA. More or less the whole of the United States does not do DORA. So this idea that you know, we are just following the flow, I would object to that. No, we're but ahead of the flow. We're ahead yeah. of the flow. So well, and I you think know, there are 153 countries that actually did sign DORA. So, but I, I think you can read the work of a scientist, right? You do, I, and I do not necessarily need an impact factor or an age factor. I can read their work and I can judge because I'm an expert in my field. I agree, but often you have a pile of 12 proposals and often, especially at NWO multidisciplinary recognition, you're not an expert. So it's a time issue and it's an expertise issue. So I agree, you should have both. You should and have the impact factor and be able to read. We never said, so I spoke at some point in the European context to one of the DORA founders and said, you know, what was the point of DORA? I said, well, we just wanted to, to, to not uh, allow very excessive use of the impact factor. That's how it all started. Like, you could not be judged only on the impact factor. Said, yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. But that then emerged by more radical factions, like a complete ban. 
Yeah. And that's the, the thing you should have just on board. It should not never be the only indicator. Okay, that's in the but interest I, of <laughs> dividing speech. Can, can I start with Megan for a second again? So uh, Hanneke has a, a plan for advising younger researchers that she is supervising. Are people talking to you and your colleagues about this, your personal career goals, your strategic goals, and how to adapt your plans for publication and research and other activities on the basis of that? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I really want to reflect indeed to, uh, for instance, my personal situation. Yes, um, I'm a chair of uh, PNN, so of course, uh, on the workflow, we, 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 we're talking about certain, uh, well, for instance, recognition and rewards, and that I'm going to this, uh, this festival today. And um, it's, it's like uh, we're, we're talking about it, and um, immediately after, we, we start again talking about research. Uh, also, well, what, what we're seeing now. And I think what's also very important is that um, through all layers, so we, indeed what, you, what you're saying is that we ourselves are now in the transition, what do we want? And internationally, not always, but mostly it's more research-based. But I think um, what's always also very important is everybody does research, that won't change. Um, but the extra things is what makes you special and also um, that's where you're selected based on. And um, to harness your talents and develop them also with, with a mentor, let's say a mentor, um, is something that really uh, can help. And I think Recognition Awards really says that, states that, and can add. And that would also make people more interesting internationally, I, is yeah. my opinion. What you're pointing out is the importance of leadership, which I think yeah. you have <laughs> just defended showing <laughs> to your younger researchers. So how do you see the role of leadership in the Recognition and Reward Scheme also again, within the international context? Yeah, well, I think it is, um, it's, it, it's, it's really about strategy primarily, and, and as you already mentioned, on all the different levels. So uh, in a research center, in a department, but also on the individual supervision. Um, and I think you should, I think it's my task as a supervisor, as a promoter, to actually talk to people about their futures. And that's also, uh, about do you want to go into teaching or into research? Do you have interest to go internationally or not? And it's really about making a, a, an, an individualized plan. And I think because I'm also the department head, I also have to keep in mind what my department needs. But that yeah. also gives another chance actually to be transparent because if you know quite clearly what your strategy is for the department, I know what people I need to have, but I can also look out for the ones that do not fit within my department and I can make sure that either uh, outside the Netherlands or in companies that they can find their way because I think we have so many talented people that can always find a good position but I see it as my task to guide them as far as I can. Now given the importance of leadership uh, Marcel and this is also part of building a successful research team and carrying out successful research project would there be room for leadership in the NWO criteria? Yeah, leadership, but uh, again, it has to be related to research because yeah. that's what we are all about. And we also need to think about it. it you cannot ask a veiny candidate, uh, uh, an early postdoctoral candidate, uh, about leadership. You can ask, but you cannot, you, I mean, you cannot require from them that they have demonstrated that much leadership. They have just done their PhD and probably another fantastic things in leadership. But if you're in a much higher level, let's say at the video, and certainly at the Vici level, of course you will ask about leadership. Um, so I think that's the way you can look at it. And it would be really strange if we, in this Vici competition, which is for senior scientists, which is really competitive, if we do not even ask them, what have you done for your group and Good. for your team? And what have you done for young scientists? Um, so, yes, of course, there it will be a criterion. And by the way, the, the things that you're doing, so you're advocating for uh, attaching importance to certain aspects of research. You've yes. been very vocal about it and visible about it. That's showing a form of leadership. And you are chairing the PNN. Yeah, and so at yeah. your own yeah. level, <laughs> you're definitely <laughs> demonstrating no, but that's, exactly. that's exactly, yeah. and that counts. But it's yeah. not always yeah. directly related to your own research and your mm. research project, but you can use it in making a case for why you should be yeah. allowed to receive grants. Yes. 
Other experiences with international reputation, how do your international colleagues, Hanneke, look on what is going on uh, in the Netherlands? Well, they are actually, um, they actually really like it. They, 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 when I tell them about this, they, they recognize the situation. I think um, that you do many more things than just doing research that is very recognizable to, to all my yeah. international colleagues. And uh, I think they are sort of, especially my American colleagues, they are sort of watching and seeing. And I think that they, they, are, they will start to copy it at some point. And I think uh, one of the, the, the sayings that we're doing this on our own, I think we already heard this morning and with, uh, with the minister, that we are not on our own anymore. It's a European-wide uh, thing. And I, I actually believe that if we can set uh, an example and actually show what it will bring us, I can only imagine that, that America will follow uh, perhaps a little later, but yeah. I know that my colleagues are actually looking yeah, forward. Sure. I'm also very interested in the other side of the coin, which is how attractive are we going to stay for people from other countries yeah. that will come to the Netherlands. I was visiting ASML uh, a couple of weeks ago, which is actually spending more on research than any university in the Netherlands. And lots of people are doing very fundamental research there. And the people I spoke to, they came from all over the world. And they have many more applicants than they can ever, ever um, uh, satisfy. And, 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 and actually, the criteria they're looking at is, okay, you have to be a very good scientist, then we will hire you. But you also have to be a team player. You need to understand valorization. And you need to have communication skills. Wow, that's exactly what we actually, the direction we want to move. And it's actually not discouraging people from China, from the US, from any European country to apply for such a job. Could I also ask, are you in touch with uh, your international colleagues, the other funding organizations? Yeah, I'm in the governing board of Science Europe since a couple of um, months now, which is actually uh, representing all funding and some uh, uh, research organizations themselves. And there, this item is also very high on the agenda and we compare notes. And indeed, it's true. It is in some countries, it is really early days, but they're interested and they, they intend to move in this direction. And they're very interested in the discussion. And there are other countries like the UK, for example, and there are many other examples um, where this is already even further than we are in the, in the Netherlands and we can learn from them. And in what kind of respects could we learn from them? What are they doing? Well, it is about small things. What should you do and what shouldn't you do? Um, and uh, sometimes it's also you have to try out things and say, well, we have tried to do this and then it didn't work out that well. I, I was a little bit triggered by what Raymond was saying. Yes, NWO did say a couple of years ago, we do not want to hear about citations, but that has already changed. Mm. And it's a bit, it's a bit tiring Technical, that yes. this argument comes back all the time mm. because it has already been changed. You can say, I have written a fantastic paper. It's been cited 5,000 times. And then you get a big plus uh, in the judgment of your, of your CV. So we do listen to what uh, people say and we try to learn from how we can further develop the system to its, to its advantage. Yeah. And how about you, Megan? Is your organization also in touch with foreign sister organizations? Uh, yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, we're uh, one of the founding partners of uh, Eurodoc. So, uh, who uh, celebrated their uh, 20th anniversary uh, Wednesday. Um, yeah, so we are in contact. Uh, they have been um, a little less organized the uh, last couple of years, but they're trying to start up again. Uh, so, yes. And is this an issue that has been on the agenda? Have, have you discussed it with them? And what were the reactions? Uh, yeah, no, so they have a lot of working groups. Uh, for instance, uh, Open Science, uh, they have a specific working group for Open Science. One of our board members is also a board member of that working group. Um, so, and, and you also see that the, there is change, but it's really, uh, it, it depends on the countries. So um, uh, there are some countries which are uh, yeah, less far in this uh, prospect and uh, are really trying. Um, and also because they sometimes ha are less represented by their country, so they're more individuals. And is the discussion in those organizations also related to issues with the academic culture or with sustainability of academia or yes. with... Yeah, and also mental health, for instance, also, uh, so the high work pressure, the burnout uh, numbers, um, th that's also playing a, a large part, uh, and they also have working groups uh, on those. Um, but yeah, no, definitely. 
So let me go back to Raymond, because one reason for the whole recognition and reward scheme and also looking at research and the way in which excellent research results, which we still want, are achieved, what uh, the role is played by teams, by open science, all of this was um, actually expedited by the fact that there's problems in our system. And lots of young people feel that they can't survive healthily in this system and that, you know, they, they don't want to work in this. What would you say to them? Because you're, you're basically sticking to a set of older criteria, which you discourage us from changing. But so how would you address the research climate for the upcoming generation? So I think first, we have to also be careful that if you're going to ask for more criteria, that you don't create a sort of jack of all trades. Yeah, I mean, especially internationally competitively, there are going to be high specialists that are very good in one little, little nerdy thing. And they're very good in that. I mean, I just call it like this, because especially in the better sciences, this happens. And you just don't want to ask them also to be a team player, just put it this way. As it, they don't, you don't want to all the time having to dilute their attention. So we need to have the discussion that if you're going to say you want all these criteria, you're going to maybe create a jack of all trades and you lose out on the true specialist. And that's a bit of a worry in the international competition. And some of these specialists, if I may, have created quite toxic research yeah, environment. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit worried about this discussion. There means there's been a discussion that competition creates agony. I would say also that power structures contain, yeah, create sure. agony. Yeah. And for example, obviously now there's a strong movement that, for example, the career development is moving from NWO towards the universities. And that really worries me. I think NWO was a really a breath of fresh air when they came up in the 90s of the last century that, you know, now as a young scientist, you can have your own money. <coughs> and if you didn't like the university, you would just move to another university. And that situation has now been moved. There's more and more career development back to the universities. And these power structures are for me more detrimental to health and in terms of, you know, you really, the guy above you is really in charge of you because your funding also relies on them and he is your boss. But it may be that super specialist who's really good at attracting money by being nerdy sure. and not taking care of their team very well. <coughs> see, this is the kind of issue that we've, I see Megan not. Yeah, but I'm not sorry, I want yeah. to, sorry, you, you, you're talking, to, you say this to me, but the thing is also, you just have a good HR department. If funny things happen, they should just step in. There are rules, <coughs> there, there are clear rules on you know, how, you, how you perform your thing. And at some point, there was even a story that to prevent uh, you know, bad people being hired, recognition and rewards should be kicking in. It's like, yeah, I don't know whether that will work, but th th there's rules. You cannot just yeah. do funny things and you just apply the, the rules that are there. And it's, you know, to, to abuse recognition and rewards as sort of guard keeper against all sorts of abuse. I mean, that should have been taken care of anyway. Universities should be yeah. better in basically recognizing when things go wrong and just act. So this is part of that university climate and we're working <coughs> on all kinds of sure. levels to, to do something about it and recognition and rewards may contribute sure. something Maybe. to that. What would you say to this, Megan? Yeah, no, I, I, yeah there, there are, I think, more things in play here. Uh, not only the, well the the change of NWO going more to the universities, but also the the, the first cash flow from the government declining. Hopefully now sure. well now there's more coming yeah, in. Yeah. But of course, like the whole culture, it doesn't change when you throw back money against it. It's also the whole culture, and I think you, I might say it's it's very uh, an ideal situation that indeed everybody uh, uh, well we have seen it in the media the couple of weeks. Uh, everybody go, uh, follows all the rules. And we have a PNN, we have a phone, and it goes, well, I think almost weekly uh, with uh, PhD candidates who are just backed up against the wall and, and most horrible things, uh, and you just can't imagine these things is happening. So there's something structurally going wrong, and I think recognition rewards is more of also like the awareness, creating the awareness that um, the culture only focusing on the on the research and indeed like the the, the nerdy professor being uh, the money maker he's being uh, well the university sometimes or instance looks the other way because they are so dependent and the culture just keeps on being toxic and the recognition rewards with more diversification less research could perhaps hopefully contribute. Let me ask the others also to comment on yeah. this. Yeah, no, I'm very happy with what you're saying because this is this is more, this is this is our future. This is also an idealistic, like what is what is it what we want for the system we are in? 
And uh, I totally agree that if you're very successful in obtaining funding, but you're not taking care of your people, then you shouldn't be in academia. Mm -hmm. Then that's not the place to be. Oh, because that's, that's, not, that's not our, our task is more than just obtaining funding for research. And that's probably also why you would consider this a relevant part of a CV. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, and, and of course, uh, again, uh, being an excellent researcher will always come uh, on a very high spot, yeah. but there is more in life and running a team and taking care of your younger colleagues <coughs> is also very, very important. And yeah. uh, so we have to diversify how we, how we look at things. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move mm -hmm. to Kim again and see whether there's any questions in the chat. Yes, indeed. There are a few questions uh, in the chat and one from Fernanda Nera D'Angelo. Um, uh, what about excellent support to excellent research? So, for example, people uh, that um, uh, work on the research data. Um, that's, that's my example. But she, she says how to reward that type of researcher. So the, the researchers that don't get the grants themselves, uh, but are really excellent in supporters other, supporting others to get these grants. Yeah, let me, let me kick off by saying again in the international context that there is a system developed by Harvard and the Wellcome Trust called Credit, which is about assigning the right kind of credit to individual authors okay. on a multi multiple author uh, paper, where e the people who do the data analysis are mentioned specifically for that task, and so they can get recognized. Maybe there's other examples. How do you feel about this? Well, I think that for some uh, roles that, that we do not recognize them enough. And if I talk from my own experience doing MRI experiments, that I need a physicist to yep. actually help me to get to the best sequences. Yeah. And this person will never end up first or last author. Uh, but without this person, I wouldn't have done my studies. So this person is essential in the whole team, uh, whole team of people working on it. So relating to team science, I think uh, a credit system uh, sounds very nice, but I think we should definitely keep our eyes open to the people that are so fundamental to what we do and also uh, getting the quality of the work we do up. Yeah. Are there more questions, Kim? Yes, a, a, a <coughs> meta question from uh, Marike Adriaanse. Uh, and it's, do you agree that some of the recognition and rewards debates seem to be based on misunderstandings uh, and how can we solve huh. this? So she <laughs> thinks uh, a few myths. I think you've, you've addressed uh, uh, some of these myth, myths. Uh, on this table, so yeah, how can we get yeah. further with this? Yeah, thank you for that question. I'm oh, going to I'm Marcel. I'm burning to give an answer to that because this is, I, I, okay, this is a fantastic question. And how do you remove myths and misunderstanding by talking to each other? And please, people, stop sending open letters to each other all the time. That is no communication. Sending an open letter to a journal. That's just saying what you feel and not listening to the viewpoints of other people. So we need to communicate with each other and we need to understand what people who are concerned about new systems really think and we need to listen to that and act upon that. And then we can also remove misunderstandings that there are. But I'm so surprised, I'm relatively new to the broader system of science in the Netherlands that the, the culture is sending open letters. That is ridiculous. Yeah, it's from sorry, a professional I, would, I would like because I'm the one sending the letters, so I think <laughs> no, I can no, respond. No, you're to not that. the only one. Everybody I, I, is sending open letters because it's ridiculous. Because this is what gets you the attention, obviously. Well, then we do something wrong. I agree. So no. we need to talk to each other and really have the in-depth discussion on the nitty-gritty of how to set it up. But that discussion then really needs to take place. Yeah. But you were just invited by Leanne, so I think that's the first step in that no, direction. I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, I'm exactly. very happy with yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, from my own professional background, I know something about mythology. <laughs> <laughs> and I therefore know that myths are very tenacious. You can't just explode mm. them and then they're gone. It's a... It's something that will crop up time and again. And I think this whole discussion also suffers from that. Because even if we've said, yeah, we did this initially, then we thought better about it, we got feedback, something changed. Nevertheless, you will hear the same arguments time and time again. And so I'm with Marcel that it also helps to listen and internalize uh, yeah, the answer that you've just been given to. Any more? Kim? Yes, there, there's, a, there's a discussion on uh, credits. Uh, and a question from, from Germany. Uh, in Germany, there's a huge discussion about limited work contracts for postdocs. Ich bin Hanna. Hashtag Ich bin Hanna. 
And of course, performance indicators play an important role too. Do you address the problem of limited work contracts too? Yep. Who would like to say something about that? The, the temporary contracts. So I think we already made a, a slight step in a good direction to, to work towards more fixed positions or if after one year, at least for the assistant associate professors, to give them a fixed uh, uh, position. But I do feel that for uh, postdocs and also our junior teachers uh, that we still have uh, a lot of steps to take. But I think, again, here it's really uh, recognizing what they do for your department, for your institution. And I think if they are essential, you should also value them and, and give, let that um, um, come back into a, a contract. for. Yeah. Because now you have the uh, 0.7, the, the wegwerp docent, as we call it, and the and <laughs> throw away, throw away teacher. recycle teacher. <laughs> oh <my God>. uh, <laughs> they're only getting uh, contemporary contracts, and then they're kindly, <coughs> politely asked to stop applying for six months and then start again. So they don't have to have uh, a fast, uh, fast yep. contract. Yeah. The revolving door system, which is not very yeah. nice. I'm looking at the clock and I would give, like to give each of you, you have about 30 seconds, so please limit yourself, uh, the opportunity for a last statement. And I'm starting with Raymond. Um, I would like to be very happy to get invited by two people at the table, Marcel mm -hmm. and Rianne, to really have a discussion on this. I'm really in favor of recognition and rewards, and I think it would be nice to just get the nitty gritty right. It's just such a pity, especially as there's now money on the table. I think it's very important, not only for research, but also for the Netherlands in general, just to get this... Get right, sorted. to get it right. Yes. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your offer to yeah, contribute. No. Hanneke? Yes, I didn't want to use a sports metaphor, but for whatever reason, it comes back in my mind. So <laughs> I think we should keep our eyes on the ball. So really focus on our, on our ideals and where we want to move towards and have patience, because I think it's something that needs time. Very well, taken to heart. Marcel? Yeah, so coming back to what I just said, I think the best thing we can do is learn from each other and learn from our mistakes and listen to each other and then... Uh, adapt the ways we are thinking and the, be and the ways we are acting. And thank then you. we can make a better system. And Megan. Yes, now I really want to uh, uh, well, thank you everybody for having us as early career researchers as an important part uh, of the table. And we hope to continue this uh, conversation. Well, thank you very much. All of you, thank you for listening. I think the large group of listeners is now moving back to the virtual lobby for a well-deserved break. Thank you very much.